Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Outliers YouTube channel and our Get to Know programming. Uh, I'm your host, D.P. Lyle, along with our co-host and partner in crime, <laughs> Kathleen Antrim. And we're going to certainly stir it up today um, because I have another partner in crime that's uh, joining <laughs> us. We uh, we did quite a number on Dubai a year ago. We had a great time there. And uh, such a pleasure to introduce Tosca Lee, New York Times bestselling author, researcher extraordinaire. I mean, the books that you get into are just amazing. Mm -hmm. And we are so excited to talk to you, Tosca. Welcome. Oh, thank you. And it's so great to see both your faces. It's been too long <laughs> since I've gotten to see both of you in person. So what a treat is this? I know it's it, been a while. It has been a while. Yeah. <laughs> so I like to dig a little deeper. And um, uh -oh. I, yeah. I know I have this theory that I'm starting to develop about writers. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about your childhood. Hmm. And um, how much do you think the way you were raised or you were kind of a child you were, how much did that do you think contribute you, to you becoming a writer? Well, I, a lot in a lot of ways. I, I was a storyteller from a young age. So I used to love to tell stories mostly by making up songs when I was a kid. So I love that. And I didn't really ever think about writing though, ever. I, I wanted to be from a young age, a professional ballerina. And that is the direction I was headed up into my teen years, heading into college until I had an injury. And I kind of thought, you know, maybe I'll have to rethink this a little bit, but um, the way I was raised is I was always encouraged in the arts. I was always, in, because I was a pianist, I was a ballerina, all those things. I was always encouraged. I was never discouraged or told, you know, to think about getting a real job or anything like that. Um, I was always pushed very hard, though, to, you know, be the best at what you do. If you're going to do it, make it worthwhile. So I think those are lessons that I've taken with me into all aspects of adulthood, but especially my writing. So when did you actually start writing and writing and then writing professionally? Uh, so... I was published when I was about 10 years old because um, in th it wasn't anything big. I was published in a pet lover's newsletter when <laughs> one of my teachers said, write a story because my, my English bulldog had just died. And so my teacher encouraged me to write the story. So, and this was when newsletters were printed on real paper and delivered to real, real mailboxes. And so then I, teachers kept saying, you know, and teachers are so important to my career and my life. And to this day, whenever I have a new book come out, I send the teachers that are, are still alive that I, I grew up with copies of my my every single book, whether they want it or not, they're getting a copy. In the mail. But That's it was so teachers cool. who encouraged me to enter contests. And, and so I won contests and things like that. And, but it wasn't until college that I, I thought, maybe I, I should take a stab at this. And it, the idea was to try to give somebody as fantastic of an adventure, a roller coaster ride as I had been given by other authors. And could I build a roller coaster like that for somebody else to enjoy? And it was actually my dad when I was 19, I was having a conversation with him. I went to Smith College on the East Coast. I came home to Nebraska for spring break. I'm the only person who goes to <laughs> Nebraska for spring break. And I was at home with my dad and I was talking about some of my favorite books and just this concept of this great adventure. And I blurted it out in the, the car that day. I, I think I'd like to write a book. And it was my dad who said, all right, Tosk, I will make you a deal. I will pay you what you would have made this summer working at the bank. I was supposed to do that for the second summer in a row as a teller, which I was miserable at because it can't do math very well. And they want to keep track of money. But <laughs> he said, I'll make you a deal. I'll pay you what you would have made this summer working at the bank. If you write your first novel, do it full time and treat it like a job. And, and my dad is also a teacher, not of English or anything. He's a business professor, but um, so teachers impacted my life greatly and that's how I got into it. And I wrote my first novel and it was awful, but you know, most of us have one of those somewhere. So. At least one. Right. Yes. Well, yeah, yes. Teachers are great people. And I have so many teachers, you know, throughout my education, all the way through college and medical school and everything else that I admired so much. Is there one or two that were, that really you think impacted your choice to start putting pen to paper? 
Yeah. Um, so in high school, there was a teacher named Pat Kaltenberger. Um, she's still alive. Uh, there was my English AP teacher, Ann Cunyard, um, <laughs> who I skipped more school than I went to my senior year. But, <laughs> um, but um, I still, you know, am sending her copies of my books. And then I have to say to my college uh, advisor, Craig Davis, who is still teaching at Smith, and I, I got to go visit just last fall. So <laughs> Um, you know, I think it's nice to catch up with teachers and let them know you turned mm -hmm. out okay and stayed out of jail. I mean, you know, stuff yeah, like that. <laughs> <And> <laughs> makes their job worthwhile. Fun. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, yeah, give us a little background. So I understand you also went to Oxford. I went to Oxford. Okay, so this that same summer that I was writing my first novel, I forgot that my dad signed me up to go study that summer at Oxford economics of all things. So I went, <laughs> I studied economics at Oxford just for that summer, which means I only had about two months to write my epic sweeping historical novel about the Neolithic people of Stonehenge. So, <laughs> I, and nobody told me two months after getting home from, you know, being at studying economics, you know, was was not gonna be enough to do this this book. And, and so I did it because nobody told me it was impossible. Was it a good book? No. <laughs> But, and I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea. I mean, that's where we all start, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nobody yeah. said, here's a good way to approach your plot. Here's a good way to organize your research, which is that's a bear when you're writing historical stuff. Or here's a good way to, you know, make sure you've got tension. And I didn't know those things. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you, what, you can't learn to write about Actually, that's, that's often about. a good thing. That's often a good thing. I wish more <laughs> beginning writers would not read so many books on craft and try to make everything perfect. We would just jump in the middle of it and let's make a mess yeah. and let's see where it goes. Cause you might surprise yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And say, well, you know, this isn't very good, but at least I know how to do this now. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I have something I could work with maybe. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you know what I, to the point about research and what a bear it is to, um, to organize it. How do you, you know, do you have some tips on that? Yeah. You know, um, back before I discovered Scrivener. <laughs> yes, I, yes, I yes. <laughs> thank goodness for Scrivener because that's kind of my go-to now because it's, it's easier. But before that I had folder, 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 you know, documents and divide it up into, ah, uh, it was a lot. It, it was a lot. It was a lot. So, yeah. and, and I, I, um, I'm kind of a neat freak about certain things. So I could drive myself crazy trying to keep all these things, you know, detailed, but um, thank goodness for Scrivener. That's how I do it now. Yeah. I'm the same way. I got folders within folders, within folders, within folders of uh, stuff. And so, I got research files out the gazoo on my computer. Yes. Like I can't go on Google and look it up and find it in one minute. I want to have it, you know, all these articles and all this stuff, but you're right. Scrivener. I use Scrivener for everything and it is, Simple, easy, and one of the best organized programs ever. Yeah. It's just so clean and cheap. I and think every writer should it have it. It does a lot of stuff, actually. It does more yes. stuff than what I use it for. I know that for sure. Yes. Um, but I probably use 10% of it. Yeah. And so that 10% is marvelous. I think I should try this. You should. You've been, you've been telling me this for a long time. I, I know. <laughs> yeah, they have yeah. a free trial. That, that it's a really beautiful thing. I mean, you, you can try it for a while and yeah. see what you think of it. Well, it's only like forty bucks. I mean, you know, yeah, it's it's, yeah, it's, it's dirt, expensive. and they never ask you for more money. They're really yeah, great people. <laughs> wow, it's nice. That's impressive. Yeah, yeah it really is. So, Tosca, if you were, um, if you know, think of you, brand new writer, and if you, you know, were to meet you on the street as a brand new writer, what would what advice would you give to yourself starting out? Oh, you know, um, the thing I always tell brand new writers, especially before they're published, is that you're in this really wonderful, protected time in your writing life because you're not out there on Amazon getting rated next to a blender. You know, you're you're not getting <laughs> criticized. You're not getting and and th the thing that's wonderful about that is you can write with all the freedom and audacity and moxie that you want to. And I think it's important to try to do that out of the gate because 
it's easy enough once you kind of get out there and you start getting responses from people to kind of shrink back a little bit. And so to train yourself to, to put all those, I always say, write as though no one will ever read it. Right. And that's kind of my mantra that I take with me when I write too. I kind of have to put the blinders on, even if, you know, the, the book's contracted and I already know, you know, it's, there's <laughs> plans for, I still tell myself, write as though no one will ever read it. And so um, that's something that I, I always tell new writers and to really enjoy and be free and, and just expand and stretch during that time before you're conscious of the eyeballs that are on you. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's daunting. Um, and you also have written, you've co-written quite a bit. You've, I, well, I know you've co-written with two different authors. Yeah. You know, talk to us a little bit about that. I know you, yeah. you co-wrote with Ted Decker and then also with, is it Marcus Brotherton? Marcus Brotherton, yeah. 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 Those were two completely different partnerships. And I get asked about co-writing a lot. Um, the truth about co-writing is it can take twice as long or, or you know even longer than than it would take you to write a book on your own but the idea is to combine the strengths of two different people to produce something that neither one of you could produce on your own so that's the beauty of doing it um when when writers ask me about how to approach that or the best way to do it i always you know say that you need to know what strengths you're bringing to the table what um you know how they're going to complement each other the process for each of my co-authorships, um, th they were vastly different. And every partnership that I know seems to write completely different too. I've, I've mm. never heard any two writing mm. pairs or trios even writing, you know, having the same process at all. Um, when I wrote Ted, we brainstormed from the ground up. Um, we would plot only a little bit of ahead and then I would take the lead on the first book and, and laying down the first draft. Um, the second book, we we would each take the lead. The third book, he took the lead on writing, you know, the, the, the first draft. Marcus, our situation was very different because Marcus had the side project that he'd been working on in between his contracted books um, about the Bataan Death March. And, oh, there it is. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, and, I love that. I, I have to just say, if you haven't read this book, you have to read it. I mean, it oh, is such a great book. Thank I could not put it down. I had way too many very late nights because I oh, did thank you. Yes. Yeah, I love to hear that. <laughs> I love this book. Well, this was such an unusual situation because Marcus is probably best known for his World War II nonfiction, but he was working on this novel and he has written other novels before, um, but he worked on it for years and years and he contacted me and he said, hey, I feel like I'd like a co-author. Would you like to come into this process? And when I said yes, he essentially handed me his draft and said, there you go. And I said, all right, I'll, I'll talk to you later. And um, I, you know, I had it for about four or five years and he had been working on it for seven. Oh. This was a 12 year novel between the two of us. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. And I think that's really rare when a, an, a writer, an author can say, take my baby, uh, do with it as you will. And and then towards the end, I started feeding chapters back, you know, because I was like, I, you know, I pulled the wires out and I was like, I think this needs this here or this or whatever. And I started sending yeah. it back and then we'd send it back and forth. But, you know, is it a short process? No, but I would say that when you co-author, I think that if you do several books, you can get the process down so that you do end up going very quickly. And, you know, once you. Sure, sure. Yeah. But that yeah. first effort. Yeah. Yeah. Got, well, well, you know, as, a, as a side note, many of the survivors of that, uh, that event, mm -hmm. um, settle around Tularosa, New Mexico. And, and I know 20, 25 years ago, I had a buddy that lived there. And when you drove around town, it seemed like half the cars had Bataan survivors, yeah. uh, license plate frames. It, it's just, uh, they gravitated to there. I'm not sure why, but, uh, uh, maybe because of white sands and all that was there. I don't know, but, uh, uh, what That's a great, I mean, what, a, what an amazing was. story it was. So, you know, and, and to be honest, I, I was not very familiar with anything mm -hmm. much that went on in the, the Pacific theater, let alone in the Philippines mm -hmm. at the time that Marcus contacted me. So, you know, probably one year out of those five was me just researching in between my other projects as well. You know, when I read that book, and I've read a lot of World War II, but the same thing, I knew very little about the Pacific theater and it was such an eye opener. I mean, you know, um, parts of it, 
I was so upset about on how mm -hmm. our military handled some things, obviously, um, and parts of it, you know, very proud about the human spirit in some of our mm -hmm. soldiers. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, get, I mean, I have goosebumps just talking about it. The book really well, made an impact you. on me. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. That was a, you know, you invest your lives in these books. You invest your life in chunks of months and years in these books. And and I'm I'm really proud of that book because I, I feel, you know, that's, that is a story worth investing your life into. So I'm really happy. It's an important it one. It is yeah. that. It is that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what are you working on now? <laughs> I'm working on a story I should have had done already. <laughs> I'm really behind. <laughs> that's a story of all of our We all lives, say right? that, yes. <laughs> I uh, have I had a deadline for this one, and that's what's killing me right now. Um, I'm working on a medieval thriller about the European witch hunts. Oh, um, I'm going to yeah. love that one. So uh, the main character is a young midwife, and um, yeah, it's... Uh, what, what time frame and what location is it? At Germany, and this is the fifteenth uh, century. Okay. Oh, very right. cool. 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 Yeah. So, so after the Black Death, but before all the yes. other, all the other uh, epidemics that flowed through there, that <laughs> yeah. I, there were a right. bunch of Black Deaths, but it was just one big one. But there was a lot of little ones. Yeah. 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 Yep. And a lot of interesting things happening around that time period. So. Yeah. Uh, well, the birth of the Renaissance and all that stuff was yeah, right. shortly, it was beginning around that time. Yeah. Leonardo was coming along. Leonardo was coming along. Luther <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> so how's the research cool. been on that book? Have you traveled to the locations? I have not. And, you know, I, I still have some more research to do. And I, I've, I've had this extensive uh, outline for a while, but I'm, I feel like it needs some things. <laughs> so <laughs> it needs some things. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, last year was such a busy year. I did a lot of teaching, a lot of traveling, you know, the long march home came out. And so I was, you know, hustling for that. And so this is going to be a, a slightly quieter year. So I can try to do some more, you know, of the actual writing part of the writing job. <laughs> <laughs> the actual writing part. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I totally get that. Because there's and so we, much of this other stuff, right? I mean, the yeah. travel. Oh, the travel. I know. And we've dragged you into outliers. Um, the writing. Yeah, I have to. This is yeah. For me. Yeah, this I have to tell her, right, Tosca is one of the original members of the outliers uh, <laughs> madhouse. And uh, we appreciate that. And uh with our, with, our own, with, yeah, with our online ongoing conference that's that's ongoing now, we've started it this year. Um, she's going to be teaching, I think it's April the 2nd, yeah. and you're going to teach world building for any genre. And that, I think, is critical for writers because whether if you're building an entire world, like a fantasy story or something like that, or you're building a neighborhood that your story is going to be set in, or a bar that you know that you're building right. this little world big little or small um uh tell us about uh, give us a preview of that kind of what what yeah. you feel about world building i this is something that is very near and dear to my heart um world building is something that we always like you said we think of uh fantasy we think of science fiction but world building has figured so prominently into my modern thrillers and, and I've got thrillers set in Europe where you know you want to set the the it's it's like extreme it's extreme setting basically and, and um it played so it played such an important role in my books the progeny and firstborn which were set predominantly in the kind of underground culture of Europe um, it was a huge factor for me in the writing of the line between which was a a good reads um a, Reader's Choice semi-finalist, and, and that's set in Iowa, okay? And so you wouldn't think maybe you need a lot of world building, but it was about a, a young woman who grew up in a doomsday cult in Iowa and has to start over in the outside secular world, uh, right as a pandemic is be be beginning to sweep across the nation, and this came out in 2019. Um, but to write that book and the sequel, it took a lot of world building. And so, um, and if you write anything with a historical bent, anything with a, a subculture involved, you, you need that world building. And it's it's your readers read because they want to be transported. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the best ways to transport them to that other time and place. 
Are you saying settings important for story? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if we think about why do we write? Of course, you know, we want to teach things. We want to we want to shine a light on different things, maybe issues, whatever it is. But when we're writing fiction, our readers are reading because they want to be entertained and transported. And so mm -hmm. uh, world building, crucially important to every single genre. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, I believe that all writers are thought leaders. And, mm -hmm. you know, even if you're writing historical, it doesn't matter. You're shining a light on human nature and extreme circumstances and helping us make sense of the world and maybe what happened in the past. I mean, I love reading historical fiction because the facts are going to be right if, you know, if it's a reputable author, obviously, and you're going to learn a lot, but yet um, they're bringing that whole time and place to life through the eyes of those characters. And I, I just think it makes, um, just like with, you know, the, the long march home, I mm -hmm. learned so much um, that I didn't know in that book. And it's such a pleasurable way to learn and be impacted. So well, that, that's why one of my favorite all-time authors is James Michener. Yes. And he not only creates marvelous characters, but his understanding of the location and the history, uh, the geography, if you will, the weather, you name it, anything about the where that story takes place, he brings you there. And yeah. and 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 I learned a lot by reading all of his stuff back many, many long before I started writing, actually. You know, and uh, story building, uh, world building and stories is critical. And he was a master at it. And so are you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It all started with the Neolithic Stonehenge book. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Will that book ever see the light of day? Are you no, in the drawer? No. no. <laughs> you know, I still have my rejection letter from, um, I sent it to Writer's House. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I sent it to Writer's House in 1989, the following summer, and I still have it. And it and I found it not long ago. And it begins with it begins like this: Dear Miss Lee, even after reading the 23-page synopsis, <laughs> never write a 23-page synopsis. We're still not sure what the story is about. That's how that letter begins. <laughs> I mean. Obviously, all the mistakes, all the mistakes. So that thing is never seeing the light of day. <laughs> yeah, but that means they read it. They read this because this, this that was very soul. personal, actually. It yeah. was. It was very personalized. This poor soul whose job it was to read the yeah. slush pile. He <laughs> 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 probably quit after having to do my twenty-three-page synopsis. <laughs> I'm I so embarrassed know. by that, but it's like no. I, I don't know. I didn't know. No. You know, I didn't know. <laughs> Again, you know, jump in the deep end, see what happens. Yeah, That's all you can do. do yep. when we start. No. <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah. not sure we do now. <laughs> well, know? that's true. I have no yeah. idea what I'm doing. Even as I start this new book, I keep thinking, I, I don't know. I don't know how, if I know how to do this anymore. <laughs> Every, do you guys get that? Like, we sit oh. down and you're like, oh, oh yes. Yes. Yeah. I know how to We, well, we were talking it. about this when we interviewed Allison Brennan, and I, yes. and I said, uh, I said, I call it the 50,000 word panic. You know, you get to the middle of the story about 50,000 words and it's like, oh my God, this is a hot mess. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm a fraud. People are going to laugh at me. My mother hates me. You know, this is going to go on and on and on. But, you know, as I said, you have to, you've written, what is it now? 23, 24 books. You know, it's going to happen. And you just say, shut up, idiot, and get on with the story. It'll work out. And if not, you can fix it on the rewrite. But the first couple of three books you write, it's like, uh, I'm done. I, 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 this is crazy. Why am I doing this? Yeah. 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 Universal right. universal. Never gets, and, you know, I was having a conversation one time with Lee child and we're talking about something. I go, yeah, it's hard. And he just looks at me and goes, it is really hard. And I mean, he was probably on book number 15 or 17 at that point. <laughs> exactly. I just, I, I don't think it ever gets any easier. No. no matter who you are. I look back and I keep thinking, how did those books end up on my shelf? And I don't know. I, I, when I hit my fifties, I started having this like crisis of confidence or something. And I, I keep wondering if my mojo has leached out of my body with my estrogen or something. It's right, like, exactly. Maybe it left with that stuff. I don't know. You know, is there any left? Do I need supplements or you know, like, are there any supplements for that? Exactly. Kind of oh, bio, you know what? I'm like writing mojo. I mean, give me something. I'm going to go to GNC. I'll let you know if I find anything. Yeah, you need the chewable version. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and the one with the, without the I safety just need a catch. lid. I can slap on. I mean, that's all I need. <laughs> without the safety lid, so you can get it's to like, it exactly. Just like get it open. Oh lordy! <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, this has been one of the most fun interviews we've had. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Fabulous. We've got to have you back on, especially when the you know your next book when it's getting ready to come out. You got we got to have you back on to talk about it, but. Oh. Um, you know, as the year goes on, we're going to have to drag you back because you're yeah. just way too much fun. Oh, I, I, you know, I, I, as I said, I also noticed that one of the awards that you won was a silver falchion. Are you, are you perchance going to Killer Nashville this year? No, I'm not this uh, year. No. I, I had two, two books in that category and one book lost to the other. <laughs> oh, <how> funny. <laughs> but, oh, my gosh. Competing yeah. against oneself. That's a whole nother. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Different kind of sport. That was uh, when you have more than one book out in a year, which hardly ever happens for me. Hardly ever. But yeah. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tosca Lee, it's been great to have you. Absolutely. You telling everybody, you've got to read The Long March Home. It's fantastic. I also want to ask our viewers to please hit that like button and subscribe so you don't miss any of these interviews. We have a lot more fun ones coming up throughout the year. And um, Tosca, we'll have to have you back on. This was great. I'm Kathleen Antrim, and we're signing off with DP Lyle and Tosca Lee. Tosca Thanks for being here, Tosca. Thanks for being yes, here. for sure. Thank you.